It is my absolute pleasure to introduce our participant and host for the evening, food writer, historian, and school food campaigner, uh, three times winner of the Fortnum and Mason Food Writer of the Year Award, author of six much-loved books, including most recently, uh, The Way We Eat Now. Here to introduce the panel, please welcome B. Wilson. Thank you. to be here thanks you for coming um i um i have way 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 too many cookbooks at home so it has to be a really special cookbook to be one that i don't just cook from once but return to over and over again and this one um has been my constant companion for 20 years but this one which only arrived your publisher only sent it to me last week already <laughs> it's besplattered besmeared loved, beloved, I know that it's going to be in my kitchen forever. Um, Nigella Lawson um, is the author of 11 cookbooks. She started off as a journalist. Um, well, before that, read Medieval and Modern Languages at Oxford. Italian mm -hmm. and... Well, do you want me to bore you, really? Yes, OK, do. so you start with uh, Medieval Latin, go into Provençal, and then went into Italian and German became the deputy literary editor of the Sunday Times at the age of 26, was a columnist for numerous magazines and newspapers. You wrote about restaurants for The Spectator, you wrote about sort of politics for The Observer or op-ed sort of features, mm. opinion. And I remember you from then, I remember seeing you, you were on a great book show on TV with David Rolovich for a while, weren't you? Yes. And I remember so there was this sense of, well, what will Nigella's first book be? And I think a lot of people might have predicted it would have been maybe a novel or maybe some piece of literary criticism, instead of which it was this book, which has celebrated its 20 year birthday, How to Eat, which I feel really changed the way that people wrote and maybe thought about food in this country for the better in so many ways. And backstage, Nigella has just been describing this fantastic book, Midnight Chicken by Ella Risbridger, as the offspring <laughs> of this book. And actually, it's funny because as I was reading it, in the worst, best possible, there's no way in which you could describe Ella's voice as imitating anyone else. No. You have a voice which from the first page is completely your own. It gets under your skin. It makes, I warn you, this book, it makes you cry from quite early on, but then it makes you happy again. It's, the subtitle is... <laughs> Other midnight chicken and other recipes worth living for. And it, it really has just a wonderful spirit to it. The recipes, um, I've already started cooking from it. There's an amazing pea soup with miso and lime, which I never would have thought. Of. I add miso to lots of things, but I never thought of adding it to a pea soup before. There's a chocolate chip cookie recipe. I've read so many and cooked so many chocolate chip cookie recipes that say they really are the best, the ultimate, the this, the that. But your Paris cookies, they were so easy. They were, they? yes, so easy mm -hmm. because you melt the butter and you just stir it up. And it was, and <laughs> Kids can judging do. from how quickly they were gone, eaten by my children, I think, <laughs> <laughs> no one was arguing with the best. And also this one, we were talking about how, yeah, these two books, there's a certain affinity, not quite, we didn't, none of us know how to pronounce this, not quite chow za ga, which is a kind of Vietnamese, lemongrass rice porridge this sounds terrible in english which is why it isn't the title of this recipe <laughs> <laughs> but it's one of the most comforting delicious variations on chicken soup slash congee but sorry i'm not properly introducing you i'm getting ahead of myself <laughs> ella risbridger is also as nigella was 20 years ago a columnist um you've written on many subjects you wrote a poetry column for the pool i did um, this is your first book, but over the course of the next year, I think you've got two other books coming out, one of which is a poetry anthology, which you're the editor of, called Set Me on Fire, which your agent described me just now as the flavour thesaurus of poetry, or the flavour thesaurus of feelings. The flavour thesaurus of feelings is how we sort of sold it. Um, it's kind of, I, I mean, the flavour thesaurus if it was about poetry and about feelings <laughs> instead of about food. I mean, there's quite a lot about food in there, obviously. I'm, always thinking about food <laughs> but yeah so that's, that's and you're that also writing a fine. children's book but we're not allowed to say very much about that that is completely but correct it, but it I'm, sounds not, <laughs> I'm not completely certain how much I'm supposed to say about it but 
that's a thing that does happen. <laughs> and, and you're already... cooking a lot, and I'm sure you're right about food in one way or another. Mm. Oh, yeah, that was the plan. Yeah. Was but the point is that, I mean, for both of you, cookery writing is something that you chose, but there were many, many other forms of writing, forms of thinking, different genres, different literary ways at your disposal and yet somehow you chose the recipe and I wanted to begin somehow by thinking about uh, the title of this we're meant to be talking about recipe and voice um, and it strikes me a lot of different things get said about this that there was some kind of Twitter row a few months ago mm, and I tried yeah, to look it up yeah, and then yeah. I couldn't even sort of find <laughs> traces about of someone it. who said, please don't give me all the intro, just give yes. me the recipe, don't the, bore me with the yes. preamble. So this happens every so often. It really somebody is very will, cyclical, isn't it? It's about yes. once every six months. But, it comes but up again. Somebody will pop up and say, I mean, I, I found some previous mm. version of it where, which was headlined, why don't food bloggers shut up and get to the recipe? <laughs> And it strikes me that when people say this, it's not just extremely discourteous and rude and impolite and doesn't pay attention to the fact that food bloggers are people who are pouring their heart and soul into words for other people's pleasure, for no money. And no one has to read a food blog if they don't want to. It's quite easy to um, scroll to the bottom as well. Yes, it, it's, but it's missing the point. It I strikes think, me I that think it's missing also, the point about what a recipe is. And I, Yes, well, no, I, I, think, no, I think that, well, just generally, there's a lot of um, disinclination. There is a disinclination to see food in context, and food has a context, and it has a social context, it has a political context, it has a personal or emotional context. And look, the point is, all these um, are very important, but but you do need to be engaged by the voice of the writer. And if you're not, I mean, you, you don't really want um, uh, confessional, I think. That's a different thing. You don't want confessional. So I think there is... To, there is Although food memoir can be a great genre in its own right, it can, but it's but not I think the same it's as a not the, But I don't think it's... I wouldn't call it confessional in the sense that I think it's about placing... A food memoir is about placing a food in the background of the writer, and that's very important. Mm. I think and I, I think that when you write, you know, when in your writing, that you you want to know um, how this recipe came to be, and it can be a chaotic coming into being, and it can be that's all you opened a cupboard and that was what was there, or it can be something that you've thought about for a long time. But I think you need. A background, mm. and for me, I, I understand why people don't like it on the internet because for me, that's about the book, mm. and it's about the engagement you have with the writer mm. and a particular voice. Whereas, actually, if you're looking up a recipe on on the internet, you probably do just want the formula. Whereas, a recipe, generally, if it's reduced to the formula, seems to me to be very lacking. But it is so easy to scroll down. It is so yeah. easy to scroll past <laughs> four paragraphs of someone's yeah. feelings, <laughs> if you if that's what you want to yeah. do. And I feel like. I really understand the, I am looking for a recipe to do this thing because I have these things in my cupboard. I think that's quite a valid thing. It's a valid response and it's a valid way of cooking to be like, how can I feed the people in my house with what I have in my house? But as a person who is frequently tagged as confessional and you know, I think that's always going to be the way if you write a really big book about your feelings, people are going to say confessional. Yeah, about it. Like, yes, um, maybe. Yes. I don't think you are, actually. But you very much say. give us the context. There's a pasta mm. which I just had for my lunch day called, it's called something like uplifting chilli and lemon pasta. Mm. But you said you were going to call it flatly suicidal pasta. I was. But then you realised it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't the pasta that was feeling suicidal. Mm. I mean, um, but I it's... still like it as a title. I think it really sums up, like, you can do this even if you're there. But... When in Rome, burrata salad. I mean, Funny enough, I love that. I wanted to read some of that actually because I think it's, uh, I, we know it, we may come to it. I don't want to. I feel like we're too near in the beginning. I don't want to stumble over that. But I think that you know the difference is when you say you can scroll past it. But nevertheless, I think food and cooking is about so many other things. And Why don't you read? To, which was the one you wanted? Well, I wanted to, read to say because I wanted to say that people who write with a voice are often described as being conversational. Mm. And I think that actually it's literary, mm. but it's very cleverly seems like it's conversational. And I was, I, I was as you know, I know, uh, I know this book well, and I've written about it, but I wanted to read it again this weekend. And um, 
I was thinking about this because I was thinking what, you know, just generally about voice and how it, that's, ge that's thought to be, that it's the way it hooks people in. But actually, I'm going to read a bit of Ella's book, which is, so she's um, talking about s some stranger on the internet saying, um, you, you seem like you need a bit of help. Come and stay with me in Rome. I've got a spare bedroom. And um, so I'm going to talk about the apartment. Her apartment was perched high on a hill, one I later worked out out of the seven of the seven hills, on a cobbled street in Trastevere, a little corner mostly ignored by tourists, populated by butchers and bakers and sprawling markets, plump with greens and plums and tomatoes of all shapes and sizes and colours. I'd never seen so many colours of tomato before, striped, subtle, gaudy, scarlet, green and gold. I was so entranced by the tomato stand and by the butcher shop and by the cheese shops that I forgot, really, to look at Rome at all. My Rome was all food. You can keep your Colosseums, only leave me the markets and the cheese man's grandmother, with whom I struck up a brief, wordless, but devoted friendship. <laughs> now, people will describe that as conversational. It actually isn't. It's a beautifully constructed piece of prose. And I think that that's very important because um, as a reader, I have some, uh, for me, I, Maybe I experience writing when I read. I experience it as a form of taste, and I like to. And I and I have to like the taste of a sentence. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important. And I think we all feel like that in a way. We may not absolutely uh, describe it in that way. And it isn't always. Um, it's not a voice, as you say. It doesn't have to be a voice um, that you speak in or you. But it has to be some, it, it's, about look, it's about a voice, like all literature, I suppose, that it, it makes you um, look at things you look at normally differently or reflect on the way you perceive the world. And with taste, that's very interesting when it, is, when it becomes about a recipe and about taste because you have to push and be emphatically personal because there's no way there's an ob objective sense. You don't know when you're doing a recipe who's going to like... Um, you know, just as B loved the miso with peas, you just, you cannot know that everyone will. You have to put, you have to talk about why it works, why you think it works, what made you put those ingredients together. And I think that's what really makes um, a recipe have some meaning other than being a formula. I was going to, that, you write about exactly that in, in At My Table. Can I read very quickly? There's a, you say, you're talking about portion size. And you say, I mean, this is the funny thing. Here we're going from talking about flatly suicidal pasta or tomatoes in Rome to portion size, which sounds like a very sort of formulaic dry thing, but actually it isn't because it's talking about what kind of human beings are you addressing mm. with your voice? And you say, my portions are generous, that I freely admit. I am never knowingly undercated. But the problem I have settling on a serving size to give for each recipe is more than just a personal neurosis. There simply cannot be any precise or absolute formula to rely on when deciding. How old are the eaters? How large are their appetites? What else are they eating at the same meal? How big was the meal they ate earlier in the day? How large the plates are they're eating off will make a difference to the portion sizes too. And already you're just asking these questions, which is each of those thoughts is putting us in a different place. I've and had people I, say about recipes in my book, the portion sizes were very small and the portion sizes were far too big. <laughs> and I think... You know, the, I wasn't going to put portion sizes in at all. I was really reluctant to put any kind of portion sizes in Midnight Chicken because I don't know how much people eat. It's, the part, of the, it's the part of book, the writing of food books that I hate the most. I cannot tell you how often I agonise about the portion sizes. I just don't know. I, I don't find know. it so difficult. I'm so terrified ever of someone not having enough to eat. <laughs> I, and then I feel... But then I also don't want people to have... I mean, I like leftovers, but there's certain things that you can't heat up again. So you don't want people to waste their money. And it just is agonising. It feels like a real responsibility. It is. And <laughs> <laughs> it's one that really, I still am not sure. Sometimes I go through this and I think, that was wrong. That was, there's too many. That's but for too but many don't you think, Ella, people. that's why, in a way, I think all food writing is. So we've been um, wrongly led to believe that a recipe is uh, something which which is a, pre a precise entity. But, you know, 
the weather that day will make a difference to how long something takes to cook. The, the, where, you know, I keep my roasting tins, annoyingly, are kept on an outside wall, so they're always quite cold. If I don't remember to take them out of the drawer in time, then it will take longer to cook because they're so cold when they go in the oven. Um, the material that the pan is made out of, all these things make such a difference. So if you write a recipe in a way that's just bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, actually it looks a lot simpler, but you're making life very much harder because you're making it look like these things take a certain amount of time and that is a matter of fact and it isn't a matter of fact and also everyone's going to be buying maybe a slightly different cut or so all these things so you have in a way you have to um i suppose you have to give an approximate sense you have to make you have to evoke rather than you know, prescribe, prescribe something, I think. This was exactly the question I wanted to ask both of you, because it strikes me that in both of your books, you, you mind about the portion size. I mean, if it, it's not just some kind of free-for-all, the messiness of life. There is a sense of order to a recipe, isn't there? That there isn't necessarily, you know, I can't even remember who it was. Did, somebody once said, didn't they, that sort of non-fiction can be all made up, but fiction has to be true. <laughs> um, but yes, a recipe, yes. uh, where does it stand? I mean, it's, it's an order. It's, it's, it's a way of, it's it's way a of taking the chaos of the universe and, and, so you, and trying to put an order. See, in this book, again, you say, a recipe is a way of finding order in the mess of life. I love that. And Ella, in your book, you say, yeah, cooking you. is a, a framework of joy on which you could hang your day. I love that. I feel that so many times. I feel it's actually kind of, it's order out of chaos. But at the same time, you're both celebrating the sense of messiness. In Ella's recipes, you're often kind of telling us, I love the way you're kind of exposing the truth behind these assumptions that, again, in the pea and miso soup, um, recipe, you talk, you ask us to squeeze, maybe it's got two limes, I can't remember, but you sort of say limes are tricky. You might not get much juice out of that particular lime. Yeah, and often tricky. people just lie about limes, don't they? They assume that a lime is a lime is a lime. Mm. It isn't. I think How, you can tell, I think in a funny way, but, but a good book has to be, have a literary voice, but at the same time, you need to feel, you need to feel someone's raw knuckles in the, the, in the kitchen cooking. But, and you need to know that every recipe's been cooked and you, and when things are going to spill or in some sense, and I think that's, in a way, it's such a balance between the, um, the, the practical and the imaginary, because in a sense, although I think food writing owes um, quite a lot to memoir, it is, in, in a way, it's a fiction of a sort, because yes, you're describing, in some sense, you're describing meals that have already happened, because we're describing things we've cooked in our lives and we're talking about them, <laughs> But in terms of, for the reader, and sometimes when you, you talk about food, it has to, you have somehow, it doesn't exist in a sense for the reader until the reader's cooked it. You know, I don't mean it hovers yes. in that strange area that I don't know whether that it's both happened, but it hasn't yet happened. It's interesting to me. So my grandfather read the whole of my book. I really didn't expect him to. He really likes the cricket. He really likes the cricket and being in his greenhouse, and he doesn't really do a lot of big reading of cookbooks. And he said he's never read one before. Um, but he read all my book, and I was very pleased. And he said to me, well, it's interesting, because there's things that you say happened, and I think they happened on two or three occasions. And he says, it's like you've put all the, the things that happened together to make something that didn't happen, but it's the same as if it happened. And I thought that was a really... No one had quite stressed it out to me like that, mm. and I think it's because... I think it's because he doesn't read a great deal. He reads really big books about politics. He really just mm. cares a lot about mm. the history of the Labour Party. Um, <laughs> but it was interesting to me the way he was like, yeah, it's kind of like fiction, except that it's true. Yes. And it happened. Because obviously, when you're condensing a whole life, for me, as a kind of, I guess this is kind of particularly close to memoir, this book, and... Some people have said it's a food memoir, which I do dispute because there are a lot of recipes in there and I detest them for ages. And I really feel like I've earned cookbook, you know? Mm. Um, but obviously when I'm kind of describing the background of a recipe, mm. I'm, or when, if I'm, say, describing an evening when we ate this recipe, actually it's 10 evenings. It's mm. lots of times that we ate it and lots of memories kind of rolled into one, which means that I've already got this kind of, not quite fictional, but mm. also not kind of chronologically and exactly mm. true framework around these recipes that actually have to be 
as exact as I can make them. Because I was, in the first draft of this cookbook, quite vague about a lot of things. Lots of, oh, put a bit of wine in. I know, you're not allowed to be like that anymore. And, <laughs> in my, the old days. But my editor made a really valid point, yeah. which is that that's not very helpful to people who don't know. So my best friend, who didn't really cook, I gave her the first draft of this cookbook, and she was very pleased, and it was very nice. We had a very nice time talking about how clever I was. And <laughs> then she went up to cook something. She rang me, she said, how much is a wine glass? How, how big is a wine glass of... what? How, how, when you say put a glass of wine in, what's a wine glass of wine? Which one? And it, it was really interesting to me to think about the things we take for granted. Actually, it's something I was thinking about when, we were read, when I was reading the way we... The way we eat the way now. We, no. Where you've got that lovely yes. diagram of all the different sizes of wine yeah, glass over the last incredible. 200 years. And they've yeah. gone up from 70 yeah. mils in the 17th century to 450 mils. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in modern Britain. So, yeah, so, so it does matter. Like, it, it's it does, your, it's your friend but, but, modern. But, you yeah. know, but the thing is, the difficulty is, this is one of the things, uh, the other, so, you know, portion size is very hard. Um, but I find measurements hard, not because I don't know exactly what I'm doing, because I think that when you write a recipe, um, you want, in a way, to... You, a recipe is a record of how you cook something, and you cook it again and again, and it might change a bit, but basically it's, that's what you've done. However, the weight measures don't necessarily matter. And I, you know, I've, I mean, this, so that I try and, very much when I write a recipe, or when I did, I try and you know, explain that to some sense, that often you're doing a stew, you open your vegetable drawer. If you've got two leeks and three carrots, you'll do that. But you could easily have done it the other way around. Mm. And a glass of wine, and when I did How to Eat, I kept, you know, because these were recipes I'd cooked forever. A bit like, in a sense, although I was older than you when I, you know, that the new writing your book, but the recipes are forever, and those are the hardest ones to do measurements of, and I was forever forgetting it. And I think it doesn't absolutely matter, but you need to write it from the point of view of, of how does it matter? I mean, mm. you need to get a sense that this is the a range or a realm. But once you get too precise, I think it takes a bit slightly the joy out of the writing the recipe, but I think for reading, because it makes people more dependent. And I, I feel very guilty because in How to Eat, I said that I would feel I'd done my job, you know, if I made myself redundant. And then out of sheer selfishness, I went on to write another 10 books. <laughs> but, um, but the thing is, and it's very interesting that in that time, people have grown to want m much more precision. And I think um, it doesn't give people freedom. It doesn't make people feel relaxed. It makes them feel less able to make their own mind up. And I, I think that's, you know, if you read Elizabeth David mm. um, or Jane Grigson, Jane Grigson, I think, you know, if we're talking about voice, actually, mm. in at writing, I, for me, Jane Grigson's voice is one I, um, I, I adore. You get her, such a sense of her, her background, her outdoorsness, and uh, her literariness. She's so knowledgeable, and, and she's and, so well-read. And you are really, you're, 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 there's a warmth which you're, there isn't with Elizabeth David. And I, <laughs> but not, don't, not that I think people have to be warm, but I also feel that uh, Jane Grigson loves food in a way that Elizabeth David doesn't. I think. I wanted to ask you about this. That's it's a like very fascinating appetite, to the extent yes. to which the voice that you are both exhibiting on the page is about provoking appetite. I mean, my yes. feeling is I have these endless conversations with people. You know, they look at my house, which is full of way, way, way too many cookbooks. And talk about, well, which are the good ones? Which are the ones you go back to? And in, in Ella's book, you've just put in a recipe for pancakes, which you admit is just a recipe for pancakes, which you could look up somewhere else. But you want it in your book because it's your book mm. and pancakes are important to you. Mm. And I'm endlessly using Nigella as an example, actually, of someone where uh, there are many recipes in How to Eat, which maybe I could have gone to Jane Grigson to get or somebody else. Or, but I want your version because I want your voice in my head as I'm cooking it. And that's going to make my appetite feel a particular way. But I also think it's, you know, it's a bit like reading uh, film criticism. You have to have a sense of the film critics' likes and dislikes, and you know where you stand in relation to them. And I think, so you need, you, when you read a, uh, a food book, you do, you know, I can, reading your book, I feel I can get a sense of what sort of food you like, and where I stand in relation to that. Yes. And I think that's very important. So you have to be very honest about your likes, because as I said, there's no objective standard. 
And, and Nigel Slater can't stand eggs. Yes. Which is, and yet he's yes. one of our greatest living food writers, and he can't stand eggs, which is one of the greatest foods yeah. in the world. But he's <laughs> allowed that. I think. Yes. He's allowed to have that foible because he's Nigel Slater, so <laughs> yes. it's fine. But everyone's allowed their everyone's, everyone's allowed their foibles. And you, exactly. you None of us is be. a true omnivore. But you're right, maybe it's, it, maybe it's a sort of faking of appetite which we can somehow pick up on yes i think you, i page. think you can tell whereas that. in both of your books i mean it, yours you seem really hungry for the things that you're <laughs> in a good way i yes. mean is that, i think you have that, to have that i mean you were there recipes that you didn't include where you thought i don't love that soup as much as the one i've put yes. in so we started when i pitched this so i sold this book on proposal which for people who don't sell books or write books is where you write a bit of it and you explain what you're going to do and why it's going to be good before you've done it. it. It's not that fun. It feels very stressful at the time. Um, but Not as stressful as writing, though. <sighs> no, writing's horrible. I mean, it's, better than every, it's better than everything else, but it is still horrible. Um, but so I made this list of about 100 recipes, I think. My editor is here. She will know. Um, about half of which are in the book and half of which in making I decided I didn't love or just didn't mm. feel like doing or that I felt like I would never go back to. There are recipes in this book that I just cannot cook now because, so the oat cakes, which are the first like proper recipe mm. in the book, I've said this before, so I don't mind saying it now, they took me so long to get right, I was terrified, even after publication, absolutely terrified that someone was going to say, this recipe doesn't work. And I was going to say, it did, it did work. I got it to work. <laughs> after. Mm. It's because it's, because uh, I was basically, so in Staffordshire, I don't know if anyone's from Staffordshire, but the oat cakes are like a flat OT pancake. They're not like the little hard Scottish ones. They're delicious. You put them with cheese or cheese and bacon or marmite. Um, they're very good. But you buy them from a shop. Traditionally, you buy them from an oat cake shop, which is like a hole in the wall, and they come already made. Or you get them from, well, Povey's is the oat cake person. There are many others, but they're the best. Um, they come in a packet. They come pre-made. They're not a thing you really make at home. Mm. So I was trying to recreate this thing. And it took me so long to get right. I made it, I don't even know how many times, just so many disasters, a kitchen covered in yeast, kitchen covered in oats, just things foaming inexplicably. For, <laughs> I don't even know why. But I, I need about five years off making my own oat cakes. <laughs> so there are recipes, but even then, I'm so pleased the recipe's there. I'm so pleased it works. Lots of people are making them, and they do work. People have sent me pictures. I'm so relieved. Um, and that is one of the ways in which a recipe is unlike any other literary form, that somehow mm. it has this life out in the world. I mean, it, do you feel happy when yes, I do. a recipe I, lives? I do, and I, but I feel that it's, again, this odd thing I was sharing, so that um, when my children were little, I made them these biscuits on their birthdays that, you know, when they were... I don't, I don't know if I bothered when they were one, to be honest, but, you know, when they were two, I did a... Yeah, cookie cutter with the two and they went on I stopped um after nine I didn't do double figures I did 21 <laughs> I did 21 but otherwise it, I didn't and I love it when people say they do that those cookies for their children it becomes part of their family I did life. I did and, my, yes. my children's birthdays were completely Nigella they, <laughs> they were I mean it's weird it's as if you were there at each of their birthdays which it feels quite creepy in a way <laughs> I'm stalking you or something but it, but it, but but it, it is something that is it becomes a lot internalized and it's mm. it's ritualized and it's it's joyous that moment it is it, exactly we started making those biscuits and it just and then we had them at Christmas and then yes but I think it might be the same for any kind of writing. So I've done a lot of writing on different subjects. I wrote about beauty. I wrote about um, my late partner's cancer. I wrote about uh, poetry. I've written about lots of different things and have from having talked to people who've written novels and other things, when they're successful, they become the property of the person who's mm. read them, really. Mm. So I did an event a few weeks ago where someone had come from Germany with a bound copy of all of the columns I wrote about lipstick and cancer. All of them. She had bound them. She was German. <laughs> she had bound them into a book. And she was like, I just feel like you have described all my feelings. And I didn't really know what to say, except that it was obvious that, well, they belong to you now. Um, yeah. yes. I was... Yes, what true. a good answer. Yes. And it feels yeah. like when you write something that's really... That's the whole point, is the connection between what you wrote and then it belongs to someone else. It's like, mm. Do you know the Cazalet Chronicles? I do. I feel extremely defensive about the Cazalet Chronicles. They are my books. I, I'm sorry for everyone else who thinks they've read them, but you don't understand them like I understand them. They've, they're mine. She wrote them for me. And 
in a way, that's what I love about uh, recipe books, is that it's a very tangible sense of, mm. well, midnight chicken is my recipe. I invented it. And uh, it doesn't belong to me at all. It's like someone sent me a message being like, this is the first meal that we have had as a family in four years. And I cried a lot. Um, I always cry a lot, don't worry. Um, and... What a gift to be yeah. able to cry but a it lot. Was... Mm. No, it's not. I, I, I cry a lot. So, I cried on the tube on the so, way here. So don't set us off, because <laughs> I'm the last person not crying left on the stage. No, I'm a bit really stony. <laughs> no, it's awful. <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> Because well, I, I, don't, I don't know, I was going <laughs> to... Well, I'm going to ask Nigella this in that case, because I'm not... I, Ella and I might start crying. You're going to emote. I'm, I'm going to ask you to emote. Well, I'm not going to ask you to emote, but I'm going to say both of your books um, are written... I mean, your recipe... Your book is called Midnight Chicken and Other Recipes Worth Living For. And you begin with a suicide attempt and saying you were going to step in front of a bus, and then you don't, and you find food and it takes on this meaning for you. In How to Eat, you write about your sister dying, and mm. there are certain recipes in here mm. which, which are hers. Is there some sense in which, I keep coming back to this thought, that when people originally had recipe books, um, this idea of a receipt, it was a remedy. And you might mm. have these books, they were called books of secrets, and some of the things were for food, some of them were for a sauce, and another one might be, this is what you take to make um, the pain of childbirth slightly less. Or this is a cure for baldness. Or here is a cure for melancholy. Mm. And I sort of feel you're both offering us cures we're both, we're for both melancholy. Looking, we're both looking for one. <laughs> yeah, I think. I think that's certainly true. And I think there's a way in which... Um, there was a lot in, in the beginning of your book, that sort of thing with everything being too bright and too loud. And I did, which I feel when I do think in a way in which there's a food is a refuge in that even if you're someone as clumsy as I am and I am, that the you're not having a life that's also just thoughts going around in your head, that endless um, sort of rumination, uh, worrying, fretting, regret, dread, you know, all those things that we have as human beings. And instead, you are doing something like chopping an onion. It's so repetitive. You have to, but you have to concentrate or you're going to cut your fingers. You know, mm -hmm. you're stirring something. And I think it's very important. And I, I think both of us cook in a way that doesn't require um, any particular skill. Mm -hmm. But you have to be present. You have to yes. be there in the kitchen. And that mm -hmm. having to be present is, very, is a very good way of escaping the, that sort of clutch of all those thoughts. And I think that is a, an attempt to, if not defeat melancholy, then just somehow escape for, you know, the 15, 12 minutes it takes to, to cook something. Which is all the more precious in a screen-obsessed digital age. I was struck, Ella, in your recipes, you, so often the way in which recipes are commodified, especially in Sunday newspapers who are just trying to sell more copies, is sort of faster, easier, quicker. Mm. And in so many of your recipes, you're telling us, um, do the garlic in this particular way, sort of chopping and rocking, and this is going to take a while, and that's going to be really good because you're going to enjoy the process. Or there's another one where you just, or maybe several, where you just tell us to inhale, just sort of zest something and just inhale that citrus. And it, mm. that's... Part because of why your book resonated so much with me because I feel restored sometimes in the kitchen where I think mm. I can't cope with my day. I just can't well, cope. I think this is it. I think that because part of the reason I started cooking was basically to, to you know, it was basically to kind of be like, okay, you're alive. How are you going to do this then? Um, which, you're, okay, you're here, you're alive, you have this body, what are you going to do with it? And I think w you want to be as present and as physically present as possible, which is why cooking is so great, obviously, because you end up with this finished product and you have to do it. You have to cook. Even, everybody has to. Even if you live off, you know, beans on toast, you're still having to heat something up, put something in the toaster. So you're having to do it anyway. And I think taking it very slowly and looking at what you're doing is probably a reaction to that everything was too much. Everything is too bright. So what I'm going to do is just chop this piece of garlic very, very small, and maybe when I have finished it, it will be better, or I'll have a really, at the very least, I'm going to have a really finely minced clove of garlic. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's something. It's not nothing. And, yeah, I think that's what But I do think as well, though, that there is a way in which, with cooking, 
if, especially if you're an urban person, uh, it's, it's, one of, it's one of the few connections you have with the natural world. And it, as odd as it is, even if you're taking tomatoes that have come mm. in, a, in, a, in a, with a plastic wrapper. And I think it's that just in, when you write about food, mm. you're seeking a connection with people and everything we do really, that's the thing about being human. You're seeking a connection with people, but when you cook, you're seeking a connection with the world. And, and with, the, your, the own, with your, your own senses. Your own senses, but yes, but you say you're, in a funny way, there's a two-way thing going. So you're blocking out a lot of the noise of the world, yet in the same in the sort of sense, you are aware that the, you know, the lemon you've got has had, you know, that this has got the sun in it, it's got the earth in it, and all those things make a, make a difference. You're somehow touching something that was growing once, yes. even if you haven't got your hands in the soil. I feel that I've been involved in setting up this new food education charity called Taste Ed, and we simply take produce into classrooms. And I've met children who say, I've never felt an onion before. Mm. And I love that line, because I thought, yes. it's, it's not that you've never chopped an onion or yeah. you've never smelt an onion, you've never mm. tasted an onion. I've never felt, I've never held a mm. papery onion in my hand. And it's as basic and grounding as that, isn't it? And that's very important. Very important. And, it's, and so many of us are deprived of that. And it's therefore, yeah, a recipe but I do is also that brings think, you back. Um, you know, and this is true of Ella's book, and it's much, it was, it's much odder than it was of my book all that time ago, which is, it hasn't got photographs. And I think that, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful thing, in a sense, because it's about, I mean, I like food photographs. I love doing shoots, that's another thing. I like doing the food photographs. I, I get a lot of pleasure from that. But nevertheless, I do think that it means you do concentrate on the voice. A lot more. I, well, I, I wanted to ask a bit. Sorry. Part yeah. of the reason we wanted to do it was because I spend I, now less than I used to because I'm not on Twitter anymore. But I used to spend far too much of my life on social media and far too much time looking at very beautiful pictures of food. And I feel like it can be extremely. If you've not cooked a lot, it can feel like a lot to live up to. Mm. And there's kind of some scope for imagination in having these drawings and having this kind of sketchy feeling of things being, oh, it's going to be kind of like this, which it was very interesting to me. So we did a shoot for 12 of the recipes for magazines mm, and I things saw. like that, which was a lot of fun and very strange and also very stressful because the book hadn't come out yet and I was just terrified they were going to discover a terrible typo um, in one of the recipes and it was going to be, we've printed all of these books. <laughs> and they're all wrong. But they were all right. Um, but it was, felt like a very different experience. Tweeting out or putting out recipes into the world that came with these beautiful photographs attached. I felt like there was, hang on, has got my microphone. Um, I felt like it immediately became much more aspirational. It immediately became something trickier for people to necessarily kind of feel was theirs. I think I always want people to feel, I was a bit at the start of the book where I talk about, please deface this book. I mean, I've made you both sign copies of your books which have thoroughly Disgraceful, so stained, and in case oh, of yours, food, being completely food. scribbled. <laughs> <laughs> over. Should be. Um, and I always want people to like. I think that's the best thing is if someone would feel mm -hmm. a kind of, as we were talking, as I was saying with the Caslets, a kind of ownership. And for me, I love food photography. There's a, I can't remember which of your books it is in Nigella, but there's a duck with pomegranate bits on. And I used to look at that page. Yeah. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I know. I always say to Yotan, mm. I was doing pomegranates before you even. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? What is this? <laughs> um, no, but yes, that's very. That was Beast. very long. Is but no, bee? that's no, bites. It's not... No, it's bites. Oh, I, I, think. I think so. So that's 2001. I think ah, the third that's... one, maybe. Mm. Yeah. Because both of you, I mean, following on from what Ella just said, both of your voices, part of why I love them so much. I mean, Nigella has this line in this book, strangely, it can take enormous confidence to trust your own palate. And I feel that's what you're talking about as well. And that's what you show on the page is this kind of warmth and openness and kindness. But that's almost too weak a word because in a sense, you are allowing people and their own kitchens into your voice and you're allowing a possibility that their kitchens might be different from yours. And they had to be, and also I feel that you have to start from the premise you're not apologising for the fact that you're asking people to cook, because I'm not asking for people to cook, because actually I'm also very, I, I like just talking about food and I like reading about food. I read a lot of food books 
when I'm not cooking, you know, I just like reading them. But nevertheless, there is, you know, something that you were saying about everything having to be fast, that there is this a way in which food is often written about as if it's something you want to get out of the way with as sort of little trouble as possible. And to an extent, I understand that. But then I always think then you don't need a recipe for the sort of food that's simple because you just put a chicken in the oven, you know, that you don't actually need to be doing anything. But I, or, you know, have a bowl of pasta. You know, it's not actually that difficult. But I, but I do think you, that f when you write about food, you think about so many other things and you have to have room to discuss that, not discuss is one word, to kind of alight on some of those things. And but it's in funny a way, that's what makes it an exchange. It's, it's, you say it's not that difficult. You taught my husband how to roast a chicken. I mean, <laughs> those very few words you have in how to eat when you mm. describe the way that your mother roasted a chicken, which is now the way you do it, mm. those, those words, that couple of paragraphs taught my husband how to cook. He didn't cook anything before. <laughs> then he learned how to roast a chicken from that. Then he learned how to make pizza from how to be a domestic goddess. Um, <laughs> so it's, I wanted to ask both of you, I mean, leading on from that, I mean, you both, voice is the subject today. Mm. Who are you talking to? Who are you writing to? Is it yourself? I think are it's you? always very interesting because when, you're, when I was writing this book, I was very aware that there would be people the people who buy cookbooks tend to be people who can cook, I, unless it's specifically marketed as, this is a cookbook that anyone can cook from. And, but also, I was aware that I wanted to try and make a cookbook that had something to say to people who, like me, had spent you know, a year <laughs> Googling rice how cook, rice how long cook, um, <laughs> <laughs> and kind of wanted to do different things and wanted something kind of solid and tangible that wasn't... You look, just... You're so lucky. I started off pre-Google. <laughs> <laughs> I only learned to cook pretty... You know, there are, mm. when I have a recipe that I got from family, I have said so, because most of my learning to cook came from, well, I have to eat something. And, mm. you know, my culinary repertoire is really limited at the point where I started this book mm. to... I can boil pasta. I can put pesto on some boiled pasta, and I can grate cheese. Um, so th I was just trying to. <laughs> so I guess uh, who am I talking to? I'm talking to somebody a bit like me when I, before I had this book. Mm. I think the person I'm talking to is somebody who is possibly a bit worried about cooking. And you know, there are recipes in there I, I think that speak to people who aren't worried about cooking. But I think the person I had in mind with somebody who'd be happier cooking with someone else in the kitchen with them. Um, and I wanted to be able to be that somebody else for people who didn't have someone to be like, oh, no, no, don't worry that's about it. That's, that exactly, that's, exactly, no, that's actually the intro of How to Eat that says... Mm. Um, yeah, I think that's the same is that... And I think the difficulty is once you've written a food book, people either want you to be an expert or they think you're claiming you, you, that you're an expert. And yet... Do you know, the thing is, is that all of us who cook, we're not experts, and yet we're still, we still cook, and that's how the human race keeps alive. And, not, you know, not, you don't need to have a, you know, tall hat and know how to, um, you know, spin sugar. So, I, and I, but I think it's quite difficult. So I think that, in a way, it is that person. It is the person that, the person you are inside it that is a bit, that's making your way in the kitchen. And at the same time, I think... I don't know. I, I've never qu quite understood because if, once you think of a reader, you can't write. Mm. So in that sense, True, there can, isn't yeah. someone. I mean, I think that um, to, I'm, I, I think a lot of my uh, food writing is a way of continuing conversations that I had with my sister. And so I would be talking about food and mm. and what we were cooking all the time. But on the other hand, I also have friends who I feel have. Uh, frightened of cooking and who think cooking is something so much more complicated than it is. So I so, sort of just wanted to sort of calm them and get them into the kitchen before they absolutely realised they were there. Yes, exactly. And, exactly. Yeah, it's and kind of lulling it's people in. Yes. It's one reason I wanted to put in... So there are a couple of recipes in this book where I'm just like, well, here are some failures. Here are some things, which I think is a Laurie Colwyn mm. thing, oh, actually. I love Laurie Colwyn. So there's a bit in Home Cooking where mm. she just talks about things that she's cooked that were horrible. And I, I loved that. And I think there's a really long recipe for a pie in this book, the one from Danny the Champion of the World. And 
the whole preface to that is me trying to make, deciding to make, I don't know why, like half ten at night, and being like, this is the time. This is the time to make a really elaborate pie I've never made before <laughs> that requires pork jelly and a hot water pastry, which you've never made before. And I wanted to include that recipe. And, you know, it's, a, it's in many ways an account of a very long fight I had with my late boyfriend about why are you making a pie in the night? Please, <laughs> please stop this. There is pork fat everywhere. And... I wanted to include it because I wanted it to feel real and I wanted to be... I wanted to be honest that cooking can be complicated mm. and, like, co cooking can be complicated and fun and that I have written a book and often I am cooking things that... And the world doesn't end wrong. when a recipe goes wrong. Exactly. That's what, so I've got this thing called mm. this page, which is so beautiful. I can say that because my illustrator, Elisa Cunningham, and Anita Mangan, who did the design, basically concocted this page. It's gorgeous. Um, called Blue Soup, What to Do When Things Go Wrong. It's a Bridget Jones joke, um, in case people have not seen Bridget Jones in a while. Um, which I was really, I really wanted to make sure we had. Well, put it in the bin. Get a takeaway. Have some toast in there. I wanted to make sure it said very clearly at the start of this book, this is not a disaster. Mm. So, you know, and, you know, I want to be very conscious that there are people for whom a dinner's ingredients is a disaster, but they're probably not the people buying a £22 cookbook. Mm. And so if you've got a £22 cookbook and you're looking at it, probably you can suck it up and have toast for dinner if you've burnt it all. Mm. It's going to be fine. It's just going to be fine. <laughs> I mean, the same way, funny enough, about photographs. And when I do photographs in a book, I do, if something goes wrong, um, you know, like in Feast, I've said, I had to make the photo small, so I said, look, as you can see, that I have put too much turmeric in the soup and it does get radioactive. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't do that. And there was lots of things, and I don't re photograph. I just have to say, look, I'm really sorry. Small photograph, and it's, this is what not to do mm. because things do go wrong, and I and, and I think you have to sort of go with it. But it's very it, it's very difficult. Um, people mistake voice for, for I don't know for some sort of expertise that goes beyond even passing the exam. I mean, people always ask on Twitter. People say something like. Can I do this a different way? Can I do that? And I always say, there's only one way to find out. Because, you know, if you haven't tried, you can't say. And I don't know, I'm not a home economist. If I'm, and also the same in my books, I, you know, they, they get read by a home economist who does all the things that they tell me off when I say, leave this here for five days. And they go, you really can't. <laughs> and I all do, and don't reheat. Don't reheat more than once. All my books are, and every now and then, sometimes I say, um, I'm obliged to tell you to put this in the fridge. I don't because I think it ruins the texture. <laughs> but I have to say that, like, it's your, if you take the risk and you kill yourself, that's not my I fault. I also had so many, so many notes, so many red underlinings yeah. of, shouldn't this go in the fridge for some time? Are you, are you really leaving this on the side to cool? Are you really doing that? I'm not, I'm here. <laughs> I know, but, you know, it is one of those hard things, you know, so I think... I think, you know, what one's offering is, like, this is what I do. Um, I like it like this. You could do it. And, and I've sometimes, you know, readers have said to me, I've, I did it a different way, and I've learned from that because it is all about an exchange, and you can't know. Cooking isn't abstract. You can't just imagine what it would be like cooked in a different way. So this is, I mean, I, I'm aware the audience are going to have masses of questions, so I'm going to ask you, I have hundreds more questions to you, but I'm going to ask you one more. Um, which I was going to begin with. There was, I think, in this book, at my table, you have a rest. You begin with um, poached eggs. Um, oh my God! But it's taken me. I am, you know, very elderly now, and <laughs> I have been. You know, I had a very long career before I even wrote about food books. That was twenty years ago. I've only recently learned how to poach an egg. Well, so this is what I can't I was do it at all. So I know, but you know, you've you've got about another, um, another thirty <laughs> years to go. <laughs> But I love the way, so you begin by saying, so uh, Turkish eggs, the kind of poached eggs with delicious yogurt, yogurt and special kind of pepper flakes, which yeah. Aleppo... But, but you probably could use chilli flakes and probably could with paprika. Use, yes, you say that. More and you also, in a more. very forgiving and kind Don't way, worry, say, well, if you have your own technique for poaching eggs, use it. But here is my way of doing it, which involves putting the eggs in a strainer. Although I don't every day. Yeah, I just do that I was when I'm there. I going to say, that's what... So you say, so I, say I love I this line, day. you say, I admit I don't always follow my own instructions. <laughs> and somehow, apropos of voice and recipes and the extent to which it's a precise <laughs> thing, it's a messy yeah. thing, what I wanted to ask you, you both is... But you change all the time. Well, what is it like you... when you cook from your own recipes? Okay, so I'm teased question. at home, because when I cook my own recipes, I say things like, I know she says put this in, but I'm not going to. <laughs> 
Um, Zoe, who was with me, what was I doing today? I was retesting a recipe for a particular soup, and I was, uh, because I was retesting it, I had to do exactly the same as I did last time, only with one thing different. And I was just, uh, I was making such a bust, like I hate the measuring, don't make me measure it. And <laughs> you're arguing with yourself. It. You're saying this person told me to do this. It's making me yes. do it, and I just don't want to. And you're disobeying but yourself. I, well, I couldn't Sometimes. disobey because I was testing, but in the end, I do. I do often. I do mostly disobey myself. Do you sometimes come back and think, "Oh, this person was brilliant. How did they know?" Well, I do know. For example, my egg poaching. I got there in the way I did, and the way I because I strained the egg. Because a, a French chef I know said to me, "You know, it's when eggs go all that fluffy, it's because they're not fresh. So if you put them through a very fine tea strainer." the white drippy bits go, so you just have the bits that aren't there. But to be honest, when I make my breakfast in the morning, it's, I don't mind if there's a bit of a frothy bit, so all that makes a difference, I'm gonna tell you quickly now, even though, is that you crack the egg into a cup and you put either some lemon juice or vinegar just onto the white. You don't do it in the pan of water. And if you're only doing one egg, this is much easier. What I do now, which is I've slightly taken on from that, which I had it low. So I bring it to the boil, I, I turn it off and I put the egg in and I just leave it four to five minutes, depending on what size the egg is, just by itself in the calm. And it's ruined hotels for me because the only good thing about being in a hotel was having a poached egg on toast. <laughs> and now I can do it at home. So I don't know what to have for breakfast when I'm in a hotel. <laughs> and Ella, do you cook from your own recipes? Do you um, go back and retrace sometimes. those steps? Not often. I mean, it's only been out in, since January and I spent <laughs> five years writing it, so I'm a bit sick of most of it. Um, I make a lot of midnight chicken, but I never use a recipe anymore. And occasionally I go back, oh, oh gosh, oh, I was supposed to do that. All right, okay. Um, I hate following I'm really, really bad at following recipes, any recipes. I sometimes make myself follow a recipe for baking because the potential for it to go wrong. You can't fix baking. It's in the oven. It's there but I, I'm terrible at following recipes and my own I am more angry with than anybody else. It's a great irony, isn't it, that people, mm. well, not irony, but uh, generally, you know, people who write recipes tend to be very bad at following them. Mm. I kind of, I do love going back to a recipe I've written. Sometimes, sometimes I'm thinking, oh, it'd be really nice to do, and I think of a particular assortment of um, ingredients, and sometimes I Google it, and it's one of my old recipes. <laughs> I <can't remember. laughs> <laughs> so you had the answer oh, all yes. along somewhere. That's quite nice. I'll do that again. But it's but in a sense, so but a recipe is an idea. It's a starting point. It's a suggestion. I mean, in baking, I think you have to be precise, mm. and I enjoy that mm. because so you feel like it's following the rules. But I think in a way that, that you're, you're slightly giving yourself up to that alchemy, and I like that as well. Yes, I I'm getting better at baking. I thought I hated baking, but I am. Much to my surprise, this year I've really, mm. in the last six months, I've really sort of got into it a bit. Mm. And it's because I now live with my flatmate who likes baked things, whereas I really, I'm not a big cake person, but I think there's a big difference when you're baking for someone who's going to enjoy the thing you're baking, whereas for myself, I'm not really, I'd always rather have I know, I think that, yeah, I think cakes are nicer to make than to eat. Yes, on the whole. much nicer. Mm. Thank you so much. No, I don't I, I, mean all cakes, but you know that whole thing of mm. it's so it's so wonderful that it's meditative. I, well, I think I think it's meditative, but I think and it was you know I wrote about this when I wrote my baking book, which is I I came to baking very late, but I do think that human beings have um, a fantasy of tr about transformation, and I think baking. Uh, plays into that a, a great deal because something it's uh, the ingredients are so utterly transformed by the oven so it's maybe i mean we've talked about the recipe it's a it's a framework of joy mm. it's a form of ordering the universe and our messy lives and, and, it, and transformation it's so, so reading a baking mm. recipe that sort of and it's a happy ending i mean that's the thing mm. i kept also thinking every recipe the story arc is a happy ending yes that's at, true at the end there's closure and so somebody's going to eat even if, in life and even if like i'm reading these recipe books thinking I'm going to cook every single thing in it and obviously that's a total fantasy but somehow in your mind you have to want to you have to want to you have to want to get through a whole and that's quite thing a, of post-its that's a wonderful <laughs> feeling yeah. because there, there is hope and there yes. is life and there yes. is something to hang on to and I think it's very striking that in this world and in this Britain where so many people feel divided or a bit mad or upset or angry in mm. some way or another cookbook sales are going up which many, you know, a few years ago, people were saying the internet was going to kill off mm. cookbooks. And it turns out that maybe we're more in need of these remedies or antidotes yes. than ever. I'm going to, I, <laughs> I could go on, but I don't want to deprive the audience of their chance to ask questions. Will you just join me in first of all? Oh, thank you. Thank you.
I can't quite remember. I'm sure they explained to us how the... Is somebody going around with a mic? Yes. Oh, it's one of the ones you throw. <laughs> it is. They're the cubes you can throw. Oh, my gosh. You really yeah, do yeah, throw. Golly gee, that's put me off my stride. Um, so I have read all of your books, Nigella, word for word, and I look forward to reading yours, Ella, very much indeed. The one that I get out, and my kids know it's not... Uh, Mum's not sort of happy because I'm doing it for reasons of, of, of joy and happiness when I open it is Christmas. So I open that book, the boys leave the room, they know that means mum's, you know, mm -hmm. and I feel like it's almost like that music from your programs comes out of it and, I, and all the pages are stuck <laughs> together. So the vanilla, spruced up vanilla cake, I make that every year. I, I open the book, but because the page is stuck, I have to go online to find the <laughs> recipe. <laughs> so that's my joy. It brings me true joy and it, it's lovely. That's lovely. Which book do you both have that you find you open it for reasons over and above the recipes? Um, I love uh, Laurie Colwyn's home cooking. Oh, I was going to say that. Well, that, you know, that's, that's, um, that's a book. That, I mean, there are two books that I, I do write about in How to Eat. One is Laurie Colwyn's home cooking, and she's got other ones. And the, another one is Stephanie Alexander's Cook's Companion, I think it's called, which is very different because it's much more of an encyclopedia. But it's something I, even though I might not always follow the recipes, when I'm thinking a bit like, what shall I, what shall I do with this? And I can look, I can open it up, and it'll give me so many ideas. And I think sometimes you just need a starting point. It's a, it, and in a way, it's a bit like what you're looking for is not for someone to give you the instructions, but someone to have a conversation about, too. You know, so you're having a conversation, what should I do with this? And so I often look at that book, and it gives me you know, plenty of ideas, but both of them. Follow on from that. Here's my microphone again. Um, to follow on from that, Nikki Segnit's mm. Flavor Thesaurus is another one where I find, you can do that, ginger and, ginger and this, really. And I feel like that's a very joyful book for me, and her new one, Lateral Cooking, as well. And, and she writes very, very well. And writes, lots of stories yeah. as well. Is yeah, that so many stories. I mean, it's, I find the new one, the, the format doesn't serve the writing enormously. It's very heavy. Um, you know, because it's very long pages. You're trying to read done. it in bed. It's sort but, of, it sort of yeah, like it's long. you onto the pillow. Oh, yes. Have you tried? But, I, I don't think I've tried. It's, so but it, but she's, she's, I, she's, she's, she's a... She's got, a, she's got so many stories, and she's got a lot of wit as well. I love that. And she knows a lot. It's a bit where she's talking about, it starts off in this recipe, it's, you know, I was in this beautiful Greek island and my husband emerged from the sea clutching some car keys that he'd found with an, an octopus had given him these car keys and he gave them to a family and the family weren't even surprised. And then we went to this beautiful restaurant we'd had a book for months to go to and they just served one thing and it was disgusting. So we went home and had beans on toast. Here is this recipe for beans on toast. And it was such yeah. a lovely, yeah. such a funny, beautiful way of getting mm. to this recipe of... And I guess it's the same as we were saying again about things going wrong and things not being... Mm. But it's also, it's a relationship of trust, isn't it? I mean, I find the people, I go back to Mira Soda again and yes. again because I always know that she's going to tell me exactly the telling detail about whether the onion should be translucent or browned or not browned. Diana Henry also, mm, just because yes. she has both voice in Boy, space. Yes, she really does. But you know that she's not going to just do that annoying thing where she's put 100 grams of butter, 100 grams of sugar in a kind of way you, where you, like a robot has invented yes. a recipe. You know that Diana, she will have cooked it and cooked yes. it and it will taste the best, most mm. exotic, delicious, flavoursome version of it. She's itself. very good on flavour. She's incredible. She's incredible on flavour. And I think that in a way that's that's a sort of um, an imaginative power and as you said you trust someone because you trust their palate um that really is what a book can do and I'm, I'm looking forward to her new one i have to say chocolate olive oil cake and eat a peach that i keep going back and reading the recipe for i've only made it once yes. i understand made it twice now and i'm going to make it again probably this week it's very delicious yeah, how to eat a peach if anyone here doesn't it's have it that, that so lovely voice. and it's so many story, and stories place. as well story, i think for me memory. and i guess that's the laurie colwyn too is that the books I come back to, and Feast as well, is the one of yours that I come back to over and over. And I think those are the stories. that I come back to the cookbooks that are little stories about other people's lives and the way other people mm. cook and the way other people eat, I think. Mm. We have a question here. So some of the questions coming in, this event... We're not just having... Yes, we're not just having one person, didn't... Yes, yes. So, so this event is being live-streamed in... 
maybe six different libraries around Britain. I'm not quite sure how many. So some questions More, are coming in from people who are watching there, and this is... Yeah, uh, we've got uh, a couple of questions at the moment. One from uh, Norwich, from Kat. Uh, it's for Nigella. Um, do you feel your voice has changed over the years? And if so, in what way and why? Well, yes, I mean, I'm a lot older and I, you know, I'm 20 years older and I think you, your voice does change. I mean, I think voice has set your, my, my essential voice hasn't changed in that I, but I sometimes disagree with certain things I said in earlier, um, you know, in earlier parts of my writing. I, I've, and I've, because I write very much out of my life, there are times when I thought something cooking, I mean, I think in my first book, I said, why would anyone make a mince pie? You know, I just thought like, why would you? It's before I really learned how to bake. And, you know, I thought you could buy very nice mince pies. I didn't understand it, but make brandy <laughs> butter. And then later on, I actually, when I taught myself how to bake them, I thought, actually, no, I can see the point in this. And, and then I, as I got further, I um, perhaps refined my sense of what is worth um, cooking or not, and, and I came to the conclusion that in a sense, you know, it's something can be very, very complicated, but if you get pleasure out of cooking it, then it's worth it. But if something is quite straightforward and it's a nightmare to cook, then it's not worth it. You know, there's not a, a huge sort of moral. So you're, I think, just like I, you, you, you find new, you, you might taste something you hadn't tasted before and that interests you or, or me, and I might, um, at different times of my life, you know, I've written different sorts of recipes depending on where I am. When I had small children, um, having done the, you know, I couldn't believe a lot of how to eat straddles the having children or not. And a lot of the recipes started off with the ones I'd always cooked. And then I realized that you start cooking in a slightly different way and so forth. So that you, the opinions change more than the voice. I think is is really, but but sometimes I my voice when I re, when I did the audio book of um, how to eat recently sometimes I just thought, oh, God I hate you. <laughs> you know, I'm so embarrassed that you said that, and yet, you know, editing would be wrong because a book belongs to the time it's published. Is it but, Zadie, I think yeah. it's Zadie Smith who can't read white teeth. Yeah. And she says, imagine if something you wrote when you were 21 was out there and people kept telling you how clever it was. Which yeah. I think about all the time. Just <laughs> Zadie Smith just being furious that everyone's reading this thing she wrote when she was very young. Yeah, um, we've got um, Suzanne from Hull. Um, this sounds like potentially your idea of uh, hell, actually. But uh, if you could eat only one dish for the rest of your life, <laughs> what would it be? Well, I'll let someone else answer because I've answered something. I'm going to give well, that. I just don't think I would. I don't think I could. I think I'd be so miserable. You toast. Are you allowed to choose like a whole category? I think we're getting In a which bit case, away from voice. I would say, yeah, let's, let's, I would say soup because that could yeah. be many, many things at once. Yes. And very, actually, yeah. very, very, very sound. Yeah. Can we move on? Um, yes. More questions. There's one here at the front. Um, what do you think has most influenced each of your voices? So I know that might not be a very easy question to answer. There might be lots of things. But is there one thing in particular that, that has shaped well, I, your voice? I, I think what shaped my voice partly is my mother, even though a lot of my life was spent trying to be something very different. Um, that's the nature of daughters, isn't it? <laughs> um, uh, but in terms of my um, cooking voice, that, that played a, a big part. But I think also I've always read a lot. And I think that what, what makes, a, what influences your writing style is all the, the, very, all the books you've, you've read. And they're not necessarily food books, really. Um, so I think, I, because of the age I am, I wasn't really taught at grammar or anything because it was I was at primary school in the sixties where you didn't get you didn't learn anything like that, and um, but I read a lot, so you get a sense of grammar and you get you learn what uh, what the the rhythm of a sentence can be, and I think that you you can't you mustn't copy, but it teaches you what a sentence can do. I think it's probably the same for me in that I didn't really read a lot of cookbooks. I've said I spent a lot of time looking at that picture of beef with pomegranate, duck with pomegranates on it. Mm. Um, but I didn't really read a lot of cookbooks. Most of my kind of reading about food 
I, I mean, cook, being a person who has written a cookbook came as a huge surprise to me. It was basically accidental, and I really didn't think that that was going to be the thing that I wanted to write about. Most of my influences, I think, are the fiction I've read. Mostly it's fiction, mostly... So before I gave up... Everyone's going to be so cross with me for saying this. Um, so before I gave up looking at my own reviews and reading nasty things people had said about me on the internet, I got this Amazon review where someone said, and it's the best mean thing anyone's ever said about me, mm. which is that I wrote like a dozen Edwardian children's authors who didn't know how to finish a sentence. <laughs> and that is very and good. That's a very high class mm. it was a real, Amazon review. It was a real, like, it went on. It was not all that good. But I think about that a lot in the, yeah, that... That's where all my yeah, exactly. There should it's be the some in praise for like just like people say backhanded compliment. There should be like insult that misfires. Yes. yes. Because they've paid you a deep compliment. Well, yes. they're too stupid to realise. <laughs> oh, okay. the thing is, yes, I guess because it does your come book from... does make me think of childhood. It does make me think of reading. Mm. Well, I, I don't know. I, I had in some ways this very this childhood that doesn't seem to exist anymore, although I guess it does because people didn't think it existed in the 1990s, where we spent a lot of time outdoors and on bicycles and never really seeing our parents. My mother's just like, well, I don't know what you did. I don't know and what you did. And in the jam recipe, you, you talk about that, don't you? The, yes. The strawberry yes. jam sandwiches. Sort of... We're just outside all the time. And it was a very kind of Edwardian childhood in lots of ways. And so I think probably E. Nesbitt is a big influence. And the way they eat in E. Nesbitt as well, and the way they eat in the, like, the Treasure Seekers and the Whitby Goods, mm -hmm. and th generally things like that. I love that scene where they're trying to wash the fruit for the Christmas pudding, and they don't realise <laughs> you, don't, you don't add soap when you're <laughs> washing raisins. But, but just the idea it's, of washing yeah. raisins is so Edwardian in itself, isn't it? The thought that we don't need to wash and de-stone our raisins anymore. <laughs> That's a good answer. Um, more. Someone over here. I might have to throw it now, and I'm looking forward to seeing this. I'm waiting. Right over there, Someone diagonal, right over you have the bishop's sorry. move. Oh, sorry, we're making a <laughs> I think there's going to be a quicker on. one that way around. I was getting worried. Um, all of you have written as, as journalists, and you've written cookbooks. Um, and what do you see as the difference between um, writing about food journalistically and, and writing books? Or do you think there's a difference at all? Well, I suppose you're, you're romping about in a bigger paddock in a book. <laughs> you know, that the journalism is about understanding. You, you have a particular... Most, most journalists, I don't know if you feel this, um, but most journalists have a natural length, which is a bit of, to, about what length of piece you wrote for longest. But I know that my natural length is, is 1,100 words for writing a piece of journalism. I could, it almost, that's everything I will write. Whereas, of course, when you do a book, you, you haven't got a length that you have to write to, or notionally you do, but it's cookbooks are one of those rare books where people feel, you know, they're, they're, they're pleased if it's longer. Mm. <laughs> um, it's true, isn't it? I mean, we don't... Diana Henry sent some thought about this on Twitter when we were describing this event and voice, and she was mm. saying, well, a lot of my voice has just been formed by the editors I had and the mm. constrictions of the newspaper I wrote for. But I don't think that's values. absolutely true. I, I don't think, think that's voice, true. No, I, don't, I think, I think that's how still, you feel. But that's you feel, feel because you do smart at the yes, constraints. But you're channeling something within yes. it. And I think I'm 600 words, and the person for whom I used to write 600 words every week for 12 years is sitting in the audience um, somewhere. Yeah. And, and I <laughs> feel... Well, you, is, because you write uh, such long pieces now. Well, well, well but I still feel... I Yeah, so I did a weekly 600 words for Elfrida sitting mm. over there and I now do a monthly 600 words and when the monthly 600 words for the Wall Street Journal comes around I think oh, I can't do this and then I just sit down and do it it's like muscle memory you're right yes. whereas any yes. other length yes. I almost have to go back to thinking of it as chunks of 600 so I find when people say it's, it's, it's any short I feel like that's not does not it's not making my life easier mm. then short we have is a, so hard we ha, you know, short you is really a, hard it's that Mark Twain thing sort. about I'm, I think it's Mark Twain the, I'm everyone, sorry, everyone, so everyone has that yes, yes. yes. But I didn't have time to make it shorter and I can quite easily write something that's about two and a half thousand words long. It will take me about a morning and it will be easy, easy, easy. Ask me to write something that's 600 words long and it will take me a month of mm. me refusing to do it. I mean, I'm not, I'm just not a writer anymore. My <laughs> flatmate yeah. suffers a lot of me just being, yeah. well, I just guess I'm going to have to get a different job because I can't write. <laughs> Writing's impossible. It's all impossible. Well, it is impossible. Yeah. You have to leave almost everything out with 600 words. That's, yeah, it's that's so hard. Yeah. So my friend... <laughs> it's mainly not writing. <laughs> it's mainly reading things. Well, that's not going to go in the piece. <laughs> it's hard. So my friend says that the most difficult pieces to write, so 
this is my best friend Caroline, who has edited me for, obviously, I'm a journalist of the internet age, for a now defunct website. Um, but I was once trying to write a piece for her about K Webb, the editor of Puffin, which was such a nice piece to write, and I just couldn't do it. And she said, the problem is, you've got 1,500 words and there's too much trying to get through the door. Mm -hmm. like, it's like you've got a big crowd of people trying to fit through, I know, hair in the microphone again, um, big crowd of people are trying to fit through one door and you just need to get them in order of importance. But that's in a way, but that's why writing a book you have more room and yet yes. in a way you just leave more out. Mm. And I don't know what I was reading. I was reading someone talking about writing uh, novels saying that writing is an exercise in controlled disappointment. <laughs> and I think that's true because every time when you, when you think you're writing a book, you have such hopes for it. And you, it's this imaginary book that has everything in it. And then the book that comes there is that you're really aware of what's not in it. And it's somehow, yes. so I think that's... It never lives up to the imaginary no. book, does it? I also think however many words, like I've now moved from doing 600 as my default to doing things like Guardian Longweed, which is 5,000. 5,000 seems like nothing. Like, no matter how many words you're given, mm. by the time you come to revise it and go back to it, mm. you're just struck by, well, this doesn't belong there. And, but I have thoughts about this thing that doesn't belong there, and it's somehow life is bigger than the writing. Yes. And so, and it's, 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 so yeah. yeah, you have a dream of what a book could be. But you're plagued for longer with a book because, you know, journalism is, you know... Can I, I want to go to the next question, but can I just mention... Actually, this journalism point? isn't quite as ephemeral as it was in the olden days. Can I just ask, how does anyone else know? I, last time I interviewed Nigella, I was just so staggered by this fact. I could have noticed it at many points before, because I think you wrote it in your preface to the... Does anyone know how many weeks it took Nigella to write this book? Hands up if you know how long. Six weeks. No, but it took me a long time. It, has more than, it took me a long time not but writing I, But it. I, I just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> yeah. um, it has more than six chapters, and it took her six weeks to write, and it's a masterpiece. And how many weeks did it? It's very difficult to say. Mm. So, I mean, this is a very complicated question. Essentially, it took me about five years from pitching it to finish to have oh, I'm not sure about that. Mine took me many years of not writing mm. it, but it off for whatever reason. I'm talking um, about when you actually start. Actually, I don't, you don't write like that anymore, do you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I do. I do a <laughs> Very large of... keyboard. <laughs> a lady in a cafe once stopped me when I was writing with that chicken, actually, and she was just like, I must just tell you that you type like you're playing a concerto. And she just brought her hands up and then dropped them down again, <laughs> over and over again, to like illustrate the point that everyone had been looking at me in this cafe, just <laughs> slamming my hands repeatedly into the keyboard. Um, I think, I honestly have no idea. Mm. I'm, it's been a weird few years for a bunch of reasons, and I have no idea how long the first draft took me to write. Mm. I'm quite a quick writer, but also I need a lot of procrastination time. As I say, mm. I'm not counting that, because obviously no. that's, I'm not no, counting If you factor the procrastination. If I had procrastination, it you know, took me about six years, but <laughs> it took me six weeks of actually realising I hadn't, I mean, I'd written bits, <laughs> I'd done a thing, but I hadn't written it, and I had to... Because I, I didn't really write it in that discipline. I just yeah. didn't have a chunk of time to do that in. It was mainly written sort of at nights and in, you know, mm. in spaces in between, as I mm. think lots of people's books are. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm I, Really, whenever I have a deadline... I'm so sorry. I wish my agent and my editor weren't here. <laughs> whenever I have a deadline, it's sort of... I say the deadline's three weeks away. It's sort of two and a half weeks of faffing about and saying, I'll never oh, write again. Everyone's so like that. That is every writing. writing. Mm. I think so. I hope mm. so. Mm. It gets done. Uh, and when you try and... I once, as a columnist, tried to do something ahead of deadline, and I was very proud of myself, and then I read it, and it lacked any elasticity or life. Yes. Because it wasn't written with didn't that... It didn't have the urgency. It, it wasn't... Yeah, it didn't have that, the fear driving it. But I think also if you... <laughs> I think if you've had to write a column... So I wrote a column for three years, and so I wrote a couple of columns... Um, and having that weekly deadline, always, always right up to the, please, could you, Ella, could you please, could, could we have it by the end of the day? We need to, tomorrow, tomorrow it's in the paper. And I, again, I think once you learn to write with that kind mm. of drive of, well, get it in, this is the latest possible. Mm. But then I think I was like that at school anyway. I think I'm just always a procrastinator. We've got about 10 more minutes here, so I want to get more questions. One here. We'll have to be quicker with our answers. OK, it'll be really quite quick. Um, both of your books and your styles of writing are very much tied with the idea of food being something that's comforting, not necessarily something that requires like a lot of effort, but even preparing it is, like you said, it's the ritual of doing it is quite wonderful. I was just wondering, is there 
a dish, not necessarily a recipe, but a dish that you find is your go-to comfort food? Like mine is the chocolate fudge cake in bites. That page is stained <laughs> and chocolate. It's been scribbled all over it, but it's great for me. But what would that be for you? For you? Oh, I don't know. Um, I think probably it would be a recipe I call my mother's praise chicken, which I think is it's in kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, and it's... Um, I don't know. I mean, in a way, a roast chicken is the one that comforts me the most. But in terms of the process and the smells in the house, I think it, this is a chicken that's cooked in a pot with some leeks and carrots and water. Um, so I suppose that, but I, I suppose it would be one of those. But there is something I feel about just putting a chicken in a pot, maybe some shallots, some garlic cloves when it's in the oven, that I do feel just doing that um, makes me feel very much a sense of being in my kitchen and just reminding myself I'm at home. I think also chicken for me as well. I think it's actually, I think it's the kind of the midnight chicken from this book and then everything that can happen after. Yeah. I think it's the making the stock that I find mm. very soothing. I was extremely nervous about this event. I have spent today making a very elaborate stock. Um, <laughs> sorry, Tash, the kitchen is very messy. <laughs> Our kitchen is full of Tupperware that I have sort of half filled with stock. And I was like, I'm so late. I'm covered in chicken. Um, I could tell why, why you smelt so comforting in one <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of sort of frantic chopping of just like being like, well, the onions, everything is going to be fine. I don't have to do an event. I don't have to leave the house. I just, I just thought if I made a very slow chicken stock, it would, it did help. I felt much better by the time I got here. Um, but that, or in terms of actual comfort, there are times where you're just not really in the place to sit and go and buy a chicken. Because the thing about a chicken is it's not really in the house thing. So then you're left with things like, cheese on toast, or pesto pasta, or spaghetti hoops with the little horrible sausages. Very delicious. <laughs> <laughs> we might have time for maybe two more questions, I think. Um, I'm looking, but, oh, there's someone here and someone here. So, so. Hello. Um, in a world where recipes get copied, stolen, uh, uncredited, Mm. How do you keep the will to live? And... <laughs> oh, I love it, really, I think. I... I mean, I prefer, you know, I prefer, you know, credit. Yes. Um, that's, you do it, and I think very, yeah, I try and do it, but I, I don't think it happens very often. I don't know, I suppose you just have to stop yourself getting too worked up. I mean, I do feel, to some extent, um, so a lot of people aren't copying recipes. You have this, you know, there's a limited number of ingredients. People have the same idea. Things somehow get into the air. And I, but I do think that obviously there is a lot of uh, plagiarism. And I think that, um, well, I suppose in a way I feel that, you, you know, I used to say to my children when they were little that sometimes, you know, if they might have been copied at school, you either, you're either a follower or you're a leader <laughs> in this life. So, you know, Be a leader. you lead. You're going to be followed, and it's maybe annoying, but that's what happens. You're saying you like it. I think that, particularly if you're a person who kind of came to cooking through reading lots of other people's recipes, it feels to me always like I'm working kind of at the bottom of a very large, sprawling family tree of people saying, and it's one thing. So this book, it's 80,000 words, about when I handed it in, it was 160,000 words. Please feel sorry for my editor. Um, and a lot of that was me saying, well, I looked at this recipe first and I didn't really like it, so I did this, and crediting mm. sort of six or seven people per recipe, none of whom had written the recipe. But I was so... Yeah. I felt this debt to all the people who I was kind of riffing off or drawing mm. on. I'm getting hair in the microphone. So sorry. Um, so I feel it's almost inevitable that it's going to happen because, as you say, limited ingredients. And like, it's weird that an ingredient is suddenly everywhere and so, or a recipe like Turkish eggs is a thing I've seen lots of mm. and seen lots of in cafes lately. Things sort of, kind of things just kind of rise and fall, bubbles. Mm. They do. Way. But it's probably annoying if you've written a lot more books than me. Um, I have written <laughs> no, one I and think... not that many people plagiarise me to my knowledge. Um, I think sometimes it's more if, if something is, you can tell when it is, when it is, because obviously you have lots of people have the same ideas often in any given yes. time. So I think that's, but, but anyway, I suppose that's us. It happens. Yes, it happens, and I think it's always going to happen with recipes. That's, that's, that's. I live, I'm much more frightened of plagiarising accidentally. 
Yes, I'm terrified of that, that I will have you know, thought something was my idea because I'd eaten it or read about it and forgotten where it comes from. I do live in terror of that. I think we have one, okay, one, two final questions, one here and then one there and then. Hi, I just wanted to ask you, uh, what gets you excited, excited about writing now? I mean, Nigel, you've written so many books and Ella, it's your first book. What, it, is it the pleasure of sharing? Is it the pleasure of I cooking? I suppose it is the pleasure of sharing, but in terms of writing, I think writing, you, you kind of, it, it's, a, it's a really strange thing because it's a bit like pouring um, you know, candle wax from a hot candle on your hand because it hurts, <laughs> but it's also kind of pleasurable at the same time. <laughs> so I don't know that you get excited about writing, but you get excited about writing, uh, about conveying enthusiasm, I think. Yeah, I... And a sentence is, you know, you're playing with mm. your, the words, you know. A good so, sentence a good is, so, is, is and satisfying. It's nice and yes. solid. I don't think I feel excited about writing, um, per se. It's, it's just what I do. I don't, I don't really know any other way to be, which sounds awful, but it's true. Um, you know, there are lots more things that are more fun than writing. Like, you know, going for a walk, seeing a dog, <laughs> telly, eating, <laughs> cooking. Um, and yet somehow I still do it. Why? I don't know. I just, I'm very sad if I'm not doing it. I'm quite sad when I'm doing it. Um, <laughs> but uh, what makes you excited about writing is a strange question for me because it's something I, I have really never given any thought to whether I'm like, am I enjoying this? I don't know. <laughs> I don't, am I enjoying breathing? Maybe. Um, which feels like one of those kind of cop-out answers of like, no, writing is as natural to me as breathing. Because of course it's work. But it's, it's, it's a job, and it's my job, and it would be my job whether I ever never got paid for it again, if that makes sense. I hope it makes sense. <laughs> One final question up here. Up here, just... Many of us have uh, memories of foods that we've had in the past, whether it's something our parents made or a family member or a friend. Have you ever tried to recreate those recipes and come up on a hurdle and say, why is it I'm not getting this right? Um, so someone actually asked me about this at another event, and I have a, an answer ready for you. Um, it is, it's not something that someone made for me. So I spent part of my childhood at school in the Middle East, and there's this Lebanese cheese bread. We call it Lebanese cheese bread. I think its proper name is Manakish. Um, you make it with the kind of cheese that you can't really get in this country. I apparently, I have heard, there is a deli in Shepherd's Bush that has it sometimes. Um, Down the skate. Yes. <laughs> um, but I have tried to recreate this cheese bread. It was so delicious. Okay, so we had it at break. Um, and the thing is, was it this delicious because, you know, I was 16 and having a break from revision? I don't know. Or was it just a very delicious cheese bread? It was like, imagine a very soft, delicious pitta that's also pillowy, and then it's stuffed with a cheese that's kind of like halfway between halloumi and mozzarella with a weird sharpness. It's very delicious, but I have tried to recreate it with various other cheeses and various kinds of bread dough, and I can't get it right, and I've tried various recipes online and in cookbooks, and I've never made one that tastes correct. But my friend Chris Kassain is a food historian, and he has a lot of interesting things to say, as you do in your book, about being able to recreate the foods of the past, even if you eat a grape, you say in your book, even if you eat a grape now, it's not the same as a grape 50 mm. years ago. If you eat a banana now, mm. it's not the same it's as a pre-war banana. But even if it's not the same, but your taste buds change Exactly, anyway, and this is what so I mean. You can't really jump, memory in, the river. A, you can't can't, jump in the same yeah. river twice in terms of eating cheese bread, because how much of that was, I'm 16, I can leave school in my free period and eat cheese bread if I want which you're never going to have. Nothing's ever as free as being like, there's a space on my timetable between maths and French, and I can go to a shop. Um, so yes, I have tried to recreate that, and I've never got that right. Also, my mum's fish lasagna, which sounds disgusting, but was really nice. I've never made it. It's never been good. I've never made it successfully. It's always been horrible, but it was really nice. We used to have it after swimming. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think that... Um, I've done my best to recreate recipes from my past, you know, because my mother died very young, and so I had to, uh, as a, as a grown-up, try and make her food from memory. Now, I wanted to bridge that gap and make it, but I couldn't help but bring the self I was so many, you know, 
into the cooking. So I think, for example, when I do my mother's praised chicken, I think I'm recreating her chicken, and I'm probably not. You know, I'm probably not, but it, it but maybe the smell is the same. There's something about the smell in the air, and it probably, and it isn't really cooked in exactly the same way, and um, so I think it's enough. You get bits of it, but in a way, even when, Every time I cook a particular recipe, it's different. So if it's different when it's one of something I've cooked, let alone when it's something I'm trying to recreate. So I think, but I think you have a, oh, this sounds really pretentious, but you have a communion with the past that makes you feel you're recreating something or makes you feel you're having an exchange with the past that, that, that feels like it means something. I think that's a wonderful note on which to end because I was, one of my final things was going to be that for both of you, recipes are memories as well, mm. is that, yeah. which is something we haven't really mm. talked about, but it's absolutely interwoven in both these books, but all of you who haven't already got them should buy both <laughs> these books. And I'm sure you'll join me in thanking two absolutely wonderful <laughs> authors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we, we've got you.